man, I can't wait to finally go back outside and do things. Like breathe fresh air, go to the shops without being paralyzed by more fear than usual, and of course... On second thought, I heard they put Trigon back on Netflix. How are you folks? My name's Traven, and today I want to talk about my top things of summer 2020. For anyone new to the channel or just unfamiliar with the concept, this is a seasonal series inspired by Super Eye Patch Wolf's My Favorite Things, Clemps' Things I Loved, and all the other semi-regular merch and media roundup videos that can be found across this hellscape of a site, in which I review, ramble about, and recommend some of my favorite stuff from the last few months, with the occasional out-of-season straggler. And if I don't mention something, it probably means one of a few things. I didn't get around to it by the time I started making this video, because Jesus Christ, there's so much shit. I just didn't like it. I generally enjoyed it, but have too many caveats and criticisms to recommend it. I don't have a lot to say about it beyond I liked it or it was fun, or I'm hoping to eventually cover it in a proper video and want to save as many of my thoughts on it for that as I can. But even then, I still sometimes try to give it a quick mention. On an unrelated note, watch Dora Hetero, it's so good! So, with all that set up out of the way, I think it'd be good to start this off with... Alright, so I'm not sure how to categorize these, so I'm just gonna lightning round it. Cool? Cool. Considering the view counts, I'm sure most people are at the very least aware of this series, but for those who've been stuck staring at the ceiling with an ever-growing sense of dread over the last few months, Rasputin's Gaming for Non-Gamer series follows his explorations and experiments in getting the lady he lives with, someone with a little experience playing games, to, well, play games. And in the process, makes a lot of fascinating insights about how we approach the medium, both as players and designers. Whether it be in the counterintuitive nature of what's now considered standard game design, how people develop a sense of gaming literacy, so to speak, in the first place, the role of cooperation and guidance play in helping someone get into gaming, and how even the most novice of players quickly learn the kinds of secrets it can take even the most dedicated scholars years, if not decades, to discover. My team's so bad. My buddy Infinite Thoughts recently dropped the thematic breakdown of the manga series Kami-san Can't Communicate, and how it deals with the struggle of making and maintaining friendships that I think is well worth a watch, along with his channel generally, since he makes a lot of cool video essays dense with edits and insights about all kinds of things, from product design to narrative structure, and if you're a fan of that kind of thing, I can't recommend his channel enough. Speaking of editing, a while ago, Cam H. Khan posted a mashup music video combining the absurdity of Tenacious D with fucking Evangelion, and its tonal whiplash almost works too well, both visually and musically. And the amazing thing is that the channel just dropped a second one that takes it all to another level. In a similar vein, the Twitter user, at EnjoyROTTMNT, threw up not one, but two videos a while ago setting the insane spectacle of animation that is Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles against the opening music for Gurren Lagann and the Irregular at Magic High School, respectively, not only giving the show the kind of anime bullshit treatment this production deserves, but also acting as two of the strongest arguments to watch the series that you can find. And considering how it recently just came to an end, potentially because of some executive meddling cutting it a little short, there's no better time than now to try and catch up. Brian David Gilbert does some cool stuff, whether it be true his roleplay persona as the cyberpunk streamer Wango Bango, and his whopping audience of three, or is the man cursed by his hubris to unravel his sanity by obsessing over video game questions no one was asking. And he recently added to that long list of stuff I didn't know I needed with a shitpost pilot script for a Star Wars pod racing series that gives the concept an underdog narrative full of over-the-top characters, quippy one-liners, and a good old dash of fast and furious nonsense. And I am not joking when I say I would genuinely love to see this developed into a proper series, Disney. You cowards! Oh, and speaking of art... Big Top Burger is an animated web series created by Worthy Kids that follows the misadventures of the crew of a clown-themed food truck, Billy, Penny, and Tim, and their eccentric boss, Steve. <laughs> Four aces. You lost the moment you entered these woods. To say the series is chaotic would be an understatement, and I absolutely love it for that. Each episode is only a few minutes long, but they are dense with nonsense, filled to bursting with so many snappy lines, blink and you miss a micro reactions, and the kinds of over the top shots I'm surprised didn't get cut for being. Oh, I'll get you for this, Steve. 
and if you haven't noticed already, the animation's got a really nice look to it. It's a fascinating process to learn about since, despite the 2D influences, it's actually done in 3D, more specifically in Blender. I think. Worthy Kids has done a lot of unique stuff with the program, including this I can't believe it's not actual stop motion animation. And it only goes to show his creativity as a creator, but also just solidifies in my mind that we've only really scratched the surface of what can be done with CG animation. Big Top Burger is a frantic series of shorts I absolutely adore. Namio Kitekure, or Wave Listen to Me in English, is an anime series directed by Tatsuma Minimikawa, produced by Sunrise, and based on the manga of the same name by Hiroaki Samura, about Minare Koda, a restaurant worker who, after a bad breakup and a drunken conversation with a radio producer at a bar, gets dragged into the world of radio hosting and broadcasting when her natural talent for talking off the cuff catches the attention of the station's audience. It sounds like a mundane concept at first that might make for a chill show, then I started watching, and that's just how it starts! The show has no qualms about diving into the most bizarre ideas it can muster as soon as possible, whether it be in the unique way it presents Minare's radio dramas or in the situations she stumbles into trying to get material for the next episode. And it's a great ride seeing what kinds of places it ends up in as it goes on. And I gotta say, for a series all about radio, this show looks fantastic. The designs are nice, the direction is captivating, and the animation is stellar. Not just in the obviously extreme scenes, but in the little moments I wouldn't have expected to be given so much attention. Like the way clothes fold and fire burns as someone lights a cigarette. To the tremble of rage in Minare's fingers when she rips her ex-boyfriend a new one live on air. Something that's backed up by the fantastic voice work for the show generally, and especially from the voice actress for Minare herself, Ryo Sugiyama. <laughs> Everything about the presentation of the show, both visually and hourly, is continually and impressively solid throughout, giving the story of a woman lost in adulthood slowly figuring out her true calling in life that much more to work with. That said, I do have to question the decision to depict the one gay character in the series as a pervy creep, but I guess it doesn't come up too much. Haha, <laughs> haha. Ah, <sighs> for fuck's sake. But even with that in mind, Wave Listen to Me is an outrageous comedy I think deserves a lot more attention. Dairy Girls, or the first season at least, thanks Netflix, is a comedy series created and written by Lisa McGee, directed by Michael Lennox, and produced by Hat Trick Productions about, well, some girls, Erin, Orla, Claire, and Michelle, and one guy, James, living in, well, Derry in the 90s. The show builds itself around the well-worn formula of a cast of lovable assholes butting heads. From the divas and rats trying to get into and out of trouble respectively, to the dicks and weirdos caught in the middle. But makes it feel fresh by giving its characters an Irish twist. And it doesn't just apply to the show's main quintet, but also to everyone around them. Whether it be the grumpy granddad picking on his son-in-law, to the mammy of questionable at best ethics. Yeah, we'll get back to you as soon as we can. If Toto, Timori Malarkey, we take her had just passed. She was lonely. It's a comedy driven by its characters, and the varied extents of their abrasive personalities quickly become clear as they're forced through situations rooted in the cultural quirks of the time and place they're stuck in. With my personal favourite being the episode where Erin's family takes in a student from Chernobyl and their reactions to the culture shock that comes with it, but also just the very blunt way said character points out their bullshit. It's class, isn't it? That's much how I imagine. Oh, because of my letters? Well, descriptive narrative has always been a strong well, point. off your letters, I see on news. But what I find most interesting is how, for as much fun as it finds in that setting, it also brings with it a constant sense of dread, since it takes place right in the middle of the Troubles. A time of intense violence across the island, but especially in Northern Ireland, whose history is just a bit too long to get into here, but suffice it to say, it was a terrifying time to live through. And it's one that's left a deep scar in Irish history. 
The daily threat that came with it is tangible in nearly every episode of the series. As school buses have to be inspected by military, the main family, being Catholic, have to leave town for a week as a massive Protestant parade kicks off, and the main character's reunion of friendship is intercut with their family watching a report of a bombing in the city. There's an intense contrast between the levity of fines and poking fun at the weirdness of the 90s, and the harsh reality of Northern Irish life at the time that, for me, pushes it from sitcom to almost black comedy. Derry Girls is a funny show that pulls a lot of jokes and drama out of its characters and setting. Dwellers Empty Path is an RPG Maker style game developed by Temi Chang, set in a world besieged by beasts and magic about Yoki, a monster like inhabitant of a mountain village as she goes about her day and gets lost in all kinds of meandering misadventures. It's a nice follow up to the developer's previous game, Escaped Chasm, that greatly expands on the mechanics and world, with more detailed environments to explore, more quirky characters to get to know, more art and designs to get obsessed with, and some fantastic music developed with the help of Toby Fox and Camellia to get lost in the melody of Wall wandering through this Game Boy colored world, one that likes to play around with and poke fun at the tropes and cliches of top-down RPGs, whether it being characters getting confused by the names and descriptions of common game mechanics, or stumbling into the middle of someone else's boss battle. And as mentioned before, there's a lot of neat little self-contained adventures to find, and as a result, lots of different endings to finish the game with depending on how many you manage to discover, and each of which gives you just a little more perspective on the many sides of this wholesome world filled with sinister secrets. It's just a nice little game to chill with. Helltaker is a puzzle game slash dating sim developed by Van Ripper where you play as the Helltaker, a dude with a thing for demon girls who decides to do what all of us can only dream of and goes to hell to build a harem of demonic cuties. And I cannot get enough of this game. The art and aesthetic? Poppin'. The music? Slappin'. The demons? Bangin'. Judgment? Best girl. Fuck you. Fight me. But more specifically, even if I did have a lot of trouble figuring it out half the time, it's a fun game that plays around with its mechanics in neat ways. At its most basic, it asks you to navigate mazes of kickable objects and enemies in a certain amount of moves or get fucking obliterated, and quickly introduces new twists and turns with each level, like obstacles that take extra moves to get past, levels full of red herrings and secret items, and even a bullet hell style boss battle, and I really enjoyed making my way through it. The same goes for the dating mechanics, as you have to make sure to say just the right thing to get each girl on your side lest you get horribly murdered or worse, rejected. And each branch of personality infused dialogue is just fun to read through. It does a lot of cool stuff in its incredibly short one time of like an hour at most. Although it has made me realize how little demon boy stuff there is in media and I'll be honest I don't know how I feel about that. Yeah well who's gonna buy a game about Bishonen devils and Oni himbos? Me that's who! It's short, sweet, to the point and free so there's really no excuse not to at least try it. Carrion is a reverse horror game developed by Phobia Game Studios and published by Devolver Digital in which you take on the role of what I can only describe as a Lovecraftian wet dream after being accidentally awakened by human scientists as you rip and tear your way through their facilities to freedom. There's nothing quite like playing a monster, and I don't mean metaphorically like being bad and infamous or whatever, I mean like playing Venom in Ultimate Spider-Man. And Carrion hits that same sweet spot for me. There's something almost addictively fun about slithering through vents and squirming through caves of gathering mass in the most destructive way possible, and getting revenge on the mortals foolish enough to think they stand a chance against- Oh fuck shit, goddammit! But the main fun of the game for me lies in the structure of its gameplay. It's very Metroidvania in a lot of ways, dropping you into the middle of a complex map that sees you collecting power-ups to progress to new areas and backtracking to old ones to open up new paths, to build up nests that increase your reach across this military labyrinth, and each ability in itself provides a whole new range of options with which to navigate an attack. But they're each locked to certain size ranges, since in the game you can increase your size by devouring biomass, and your size is also directly tied to your health. So, throughout the game you're forced to pick and choose between tanking your way through enemies and obstacles at a slower pace, or zipping through halls and catching everyone off guard with stealth at the risk of getting one-shotted. It's a fun balance to play around with as your repertoire of nightmarish abilities expands and especially, for me at least, in the moments of panic when I suddenly drop a size and have to switch tactics to survive, and end up only scraping by an encounter by the skin of my tentacle teeth. 
That said, I did find that the controls, at least on Switch, the version I played, could get quite fiddly the bigger you get with how difficult it becomes to coordinate your entire mass, and the lack of a proper map makes it quite easy to get lost toward the end. But I guess even those details could be argued to be part of the Eldritch Beast experience, so... Carrion is a fun twist on horror games that takes a lot of creative turns. Umurangi Generation is a photography simulator developed by Ori Game Digital and published by Playism where you play as a courier in a world on the verge of the apocalypse just trying to get by. And I have to say, I didn't expect to end up having as much fun with this game as I did, but the further I got into it, the harder it got to put down. It's the kind of game that speaks to my creative side by just letting me do basically whatever. As the tutorial explains, there are a few proper lines along which the game itself judges a good photo, and so beyond the things it asks for pictures of and the kinds of lenses it wants them taken with, it gives the player free reign to go nuts, and with every level unlocked, it provides even more options to play around with, in lenses and in filters, to get just the right picture. Here are some of my personal favourite picks I've managed to get. You might notice a pattern with my fondness for bloom and contrast. It gives players a lot of freedom in how they go about picturing this world, one that in itself is just fun to explore. It's like a low poly diorama filled with all kinds of details just begging to be discovered. And a big part of the fun comes from finding those tidbits and lining them up for a good shot. And as a fun side note, the game's synthy tunes happen to be done by the YouTuber Thor High Heels, which was quite a surprise to discover for me since I'd only started to get into his videos just before I ended up playing this game. Anyway, in the process of exploring, you'll also slowly uncover the overarching narrative hidden in the game's world, since its story isn't explicitly spelt out to the player, but instead hinted at through the power of environmental storytelling. From things as obvious as newspaper clippings and satirical graffiti, to more subtle stuff like memorials and the way NPCs interact with this world. Whether they be soldiers coated in blood leaning against admittedly on-the-nose posters, or citizens lining up for food rations or maybe the first train out of this soon to be hellhole, and a lot more stuff that I think is better experienced blind. But those world building details also give it a fascinating perspective. Without spoiling too much, the specific shittiness of this game's envisioned future involves a grand threat to humanity that, in a lot of ways, feels quite relevant to a lot of current real world issues, whether viral, viral, or environmental and which seems especially critical of the apathy with which many react to such things, and how that sort of disconnect lets it fester to the point of potentially no return. For as much fun as the game provides in its mechanics, the overall through lines of its world give it a bittersweet undertone, since to me, the message that comes through feels like it's saying that when the end does come, knowing the limited power that we have, the best we can do, as individuals at least, is document each painful step of the process in the slim hope that there will be someone or something left to remember to put the pieces back together when it does finally fall apart. It's kind of depressing, and maybe more than anything else it just shows how much the last year has fucked my perspective on things, but that message just struck a chord with me, and I'm sure it'll do the same for a lot of other people for whom the world, due to recent events, has started to feel like too much, even if they aren't too interested in the photography side of things. At the end of the day, Umurangi Generation is a game I just can't help but appreciate. And yeah, those are my thoughts. The last few months have been going by so quickly I'm surprised I actually did manage to get around to anything. Time has just sort of felt meaningless lately. Even more so than usual. Also, I fiddled around with some structure stuff for these top things videos, mainly in just organizing each section based on length. It's just always been a weird nitpick for me that the videos would constantly flip-flop from a 5 minute ramble to a 30 second quick shot, back to 3 minutes, and so on. I thought it might work better if it built up for the most part, from shortest to longest, so it can have a better sense of pacing and almost like it's building up momentum for the video as it goes on, if that makes any sense. Anyway, hope you are staying safe, keeping your distance, washing your hands, wearing a mask, and so on. Let me know what you think if you agree, disagree, why your top things of summer 2020 were, what you're looking forward to in the next few months. Personally, I can't wait to finally get around to The Great Pretender, etc. And thanks for watching. If you've enjoyed this and want to see more, then check out my last video, where I talk about Vinland Saga's Askeladd and what I think makes him work so well as a villain in its Viking-drenched world. Or watch me talk about all the weird details of Oban Star Racer's intergalactic narrative and why, for me, they make it worth coming back to. And don't forget to like, comment, share, and of course, subscribe! to come fly at me. Hit the bell, say notified, follow me on Twitter for more updates, ramblings, and poor attempts at humor, and hopefully, I'll see you later.